We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, our guest today is Edwin Argueta, uh, an organizer with Jobs with Justice. How are you, Edwin? I'd like you to introduce yourself and... Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you were born in El Salvador and tell us a little about yourself and how you came here and a uh, little bit more about your story. Sure. Uh, thank you, Michael, for inviting me to your program. Sure. Uh, I'm glad to uh, have been invited to this conversation uh, because there's many of us that are doing this work on a daily basis and uh, uh, my colleagues need to be recognized. I'm an immigrant from a tiny country from in Central America uh, that endured uh, 12 uh, long years of a civil war, El Salvador. Uh, I came to the United States in 1992, uh, essentially to meet my biological family. And uh, I was able to finish high school in Cambridge at Cambridge Range in Latin. And from there, I went on to study at UMass Boston. At uh, UMass Boston, uh, I uh, took a class, a seminar, that essentially allowed me to put myself in the community. And I was so lucky that two blocks from my house, there was this wonderful organization called Centro Presente, an organization that has been uh, helping uh, Central American refugees since the mid 80s until today. And that's where I got my feet wet uh, when it comes to community organizing. Mm -hmm. And how did you get interested in community organizing and organizing for justice? What led you to uh, do that? Yeah, so it was an interesting uh, story because I, I thought it was going to be an academic exercise uh, for my class, uh, UMass Boston, and uh, it became uh, an awakening, so to speak, because... At the time, uh, there was a movement to uh, create a path to immigration, to permanent immigration status for Salvadoran and Guatemalan refugees that have been part of a class action lawsuit against the Department of Justice, uh, better known as the ABC. Uh, case, the American Baptist, Baptist Church uh, case. And I went from being a volunteer in um, the ESL classes to being trained at the legal department to then become a part of uh, 
uh, the emerging uh, national campaign for uh, permanent residency for 250,000 families under this class action lawsuit. And oh, so, great. you know, through this process, I, like I said, it, 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 it you know, that itch of trying to get other people together, trying to have conversations with people, trying to collectively look at the big picture, but, you know, still with our feet, <laughs> you know, in reality, just came about. And uh, I learned from great mentors. Um, I <laughs> learned from the people that were affected, you know, the, uh, asi the, the political asylum refugees. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it became a great experience for me. I mean, I would always say that uh, I was organized by my own community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who would you say some of your mentors were? There, at the time, um, there was someone whose name is Oscar Chacon. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he is now the executive director of Alianza Americas, a national, international, actually, um, sort of immigrant rights, migrant rights uh, organization, um, formerly known as NALAC, based in mm -hmm. Chicago, but, you know, they do a lot of uh, uh, policy advocacy on behalf of immigrants. Uh, and they do all kinds of trainings, uh, analysis of legislation, of policy, et cetera, et cetera. And so Oscar was one of the, the brains behind the, the, the national campaign for uh, a pathway to permanent residency for 250,000 families. There were also other folks who at the time, you know, were working and uh, sort of taught me a great deal about the, you know, some of the basics that, that, elementary uh, concept of organizing, Juan Gonzalez, who was the director of community organizing, a gentleman okay. from, from Guatemala. He worked oh, for a long yeah. time thereafter at, um, in Jamaica Plain for, the, for right. one, of the C, one of the CDCs. Right. Uh, I think he's now retired, but along the way, I met a lot of great people from other parts of this country. From California, I met the folks from the National Day Labor Organizing Network. Pablo um, Alvarado, he's a legend when it comes to organizing uh, day labor workers, mm -hmm. uh, refugees, uh, uh, young people, etc. cetera. Um, and I mean, like, it's, it's a long list of people that I've been privileged to interact with and that I've learned a lot from. Janet Wessel. Jeanette Wessel, who taught oh, me a sure. lot about popular education methodology. Uh, she's now the executive director of United for a Fair Economy. Mm -hmm. um, and the list goes on and on. That's great. And, and what would you say are some of the lessons you've learned in your decades of organizing now? Are there things, uh, what are the things that are, that stand out for you as what you've learned and what's important for other younger organizers to learn? Um, I think that some of the essential things that I think have very useful to me over the course of many years, um, patience with mm. myself sometimes, mm -hmm. and you know this, Michael, sometimes you want to go a hundred miles per hour, <laughs> but right. you know, the, uh, folks that we're working with sometimes, you know, you have to take baby steps. Mm -hmm. you know, to uh, bring them along with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to develop your own instincts. Uh, mm -hmm. Your gut always tells you, oh, you know, this, is, this doesn't sound right. This strategy mm -hmm. is probably not going to work here. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's fine. It worked in California, but this is not going to work here. Let's, we have to adjust it to our mm -hmm. reality here in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of listening. I mean, it, it, the number one thing yeah. we all need to do is 
maybe do a, a 90% of listening and 10% of speaking. Right. That is a very important lesson I learned. And I think that for the most part now, I think what I would say to younger organizers is to be politically clear. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many instances where we're, you know, we're promised many, many things and, you know, we take for granted those promises and the reality is that we should, we should not take everything for granted, that we should always organize, organize, organize and fight for the things that uh, give dignity to uh, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our, you know, our family, ourselves. And um, that is very important because more often than not, unfortunately, in the system that we have, you know, many times we're used as political football. Entire communities are used, are utilized as political football. And um, in order to get justice for some people, you know, you have to oppress some other group of people and that's not, that is not social justice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's important to be politically cleared and to always be, you know, uh, patient and, and always understand that it's a, organizing is a process. Things don't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I know in terms of that process, one of the things that uh, you have a vision for is developing a residential social justice training center where people can stay. And uh, can you tell me, uh, <clears throat> tell us a little bit more about that, uh, what you envision and why you think it's so important now in this region? Sure. So yeah, long story is I've, I've been affected by a very rare disease and I'm currently in uh, uh, rehab for physical therapy and occupational therapy. So I really have a lot of time on my hands and it has made me reflect a lot, not only about me, what I would like to be my legacy, but also, you know, the work of my fellow organizers, especially Just for Justice and a lot of the work that we've done. And I realized that we have very little a few spaces where we can uh, come together, strategize, and um, come up with executable plans based on reality. Right? You know, mm -hmm. a plan is is only good if you're if we're really great at executing a plan. Otherwise, it's just a piece of paper with words in it. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, the other thing is that you know. We're living in an, uh, under very, very unprecedented times. And uh, the fact is, there's still a ton of people who, who believe in all the lies that, that they were told under the Trump administration. And so that's what we have to deal with in the foreseeable future. And uh, we, when it comes to the community groups that we work with, whether you are a immigrant, whether you're someone who's fighting eviction, whether you're fighting for environmental justice, et cetera, et cetera, you go down, down, down the list, right? Very often when it comes to, hey, we need to have a retreat, you know, to fight, you know, this bad immigration bill or uh, to come up with a plan to influence, you know, the state house for, you know, uh, a more comprehensive eviction moratorium or, or why not? Uh, very often we run into, there's little, you know, there's few spaces available. They're very expensive and um, it they don't give us the ability to um, uh, live in community, even at least for, for a weekend where mm -hmm. we could actually break bread and get to know each other and learn about our history 
and look forward, right? And, and set and think of a common agenda or at least, you know, just get to know what are we working on. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I was fortunate and had been fortunate to participate in many trainings with United for a Fair Economy and at the Highlander Center in Tennessee, mm -hmm. a historic place for organizers. You know, we learn, you know, stories of how all the civil rights leaders, uh, you know, learn uh, about organizing, about advocacy, about fighting. And it was very inspiring. It's a very, very uh, sacred place yeah, been uh, there. Yeah. in the mountains of Tennessee. And I, and, I, and I envision, you know, something similar to the Highlander Center somewhere in the Northeast. We, re we really don't have much of that here. Mm -hmm. And the more that we're able to build like that, I believe it's better for, you know, the kind of organizing that we are, we are engaged in. And, you know, we, we deserve to have a place like that, that is owned by our communities, that is led by, you know, indigenous, black, people of color, uh, LGBT, LG, LGBTQ, uh, uh, folks, etc. And so I, I have been able to attract other fellow organizers into this idea. And I think, you know, for many of us, you know, that, that could be our legacy. I don't want to wait until I'm not longer here. I want to be able to make it happen while I'm alive. And I want to be able to uh, bring others along to this idea because I know that it will be beneficial not only to ourselves, right? But it will be beneficial to all the, you know, communities that we work with. Uh, I envision to have some sort of cooperative, you know, that uh, harvests food for the uh, mm -hmm. participants of trainings and the in this training center. Uh, if mm -hmm. they're staying for a weekend, uh, I envision to have a a library, a research library for organizers. We need to learn our history. I could not stress that enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to learn about what happened to the Jewish community during the Holocaust. We need to know what happened to, you know, the African-American community during the civil rights, during the slavery, right? We need to know more of the history that we're not taught in, in you know, in the, in the public schools. Um, we need to know the root causes of migration. Why is there so many of us here from many different countries? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think once we are, once we learn that, and and we sort of have this common bond, um, I think that's when ideas surface, and uh, we're able to articulate these ideas. I mean, there's been so many great campaigns that I've been a part of, and that have started in informal conversations at places like that, like the Highlanders, mm -hmm. and and. My hope is that in a decade or so, you know, we're able to say here, this is for all of us that are fighting for uh, social justice. Right. You mentioned, uh, you know, breaking bread, at least for a weekend. But if you could paint a picture of what this center would look like, uh, could you tell us a little bit more what it would look like when you got there? What would the buildings look like? Uh, you mentioned... Uh, farms you mentioned a library what can you sort of paint us a picture of yeah what you might envision yeah i mean i think that we need to have a state-of-the-art buildings uh, you know that are environmentally friendly uh they also have sleeping quarters for the participants and people who come to visit the training center whether it's for a weekend or they want to stay for a whole summer heck we mm -hmm. might even have programming for you know, for young people who want to venture into organizing or doing something else, you know, that is a positive experience. Um, I think and that we need... Big, uh, how big, uh, you mentioned people staying there. Uh, what numbers are we talking about in your vision? I mean, I, I, I'm talking about the ability to put up at least 100 people, you know, mm -hmm. for a weekend, for, I don't know, for a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and... and, and 
maybe even a bigger number. Uh, and I know that. Be, uh, and, and where do you envision it being? I don't mean exactly, but. Yeah, you know. I mean, I think it's somewhere in the, in the Northeast, uh, preferably Massachusetts. I really <laughs> love the idea of Western Mass or sort of the central Massachusetts area. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we need a big chunk of land to make that happen. Obviously, we need to do all our work to fundraise for that. I think that we need to create a structure that sort of leads, you know, this effort uh, and manages, you know, the projects, you know, creating the buildings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, creating the, the decision making protocols, you know, for who, you know, wants to use the space, who wants to stay in the space. Uh, I think that there are many opportunities to create uh, cooperatives for folks who, you know, want to think about different economic models, you know, for their communities. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the big, big problems that our people face is being so much in debt. It's, 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 it's like, that's one of the huge barriers for owning a home, even going to a college or a university, or even going to a technical vocational school. Um, it's hard today, especially under this health crisis, the pandemic, to think that, you know, you're going to be able to afford to do some of those things, or you can even put food on the table. You cannot even pay, you know, for the bills, you know, for heating, for the heating in your house. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, we should be able to, to think of something else that is sustainable, that is actually works. And mm -hmm. there's so many, so many great minds that are doing that out there right now, but they're lacking at a, a set place, you know, to mm -hmm. make to make it happen. And I think I think my vision uh, includes, you know, a lot of that. We definitely need, you know, to 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 say thanks to those, you know, that have done this work before. Uh, you know, some healing space where we can uh, regenerate, uh, charge batteries to, uh, uh, and do all the things that we need to do when things don't go the way we want and when we suffer from, you know, uh, all the oppressive uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, entities that are and a daily mm -hmm. basis, you know, putting barriers for yeah. our community to make progress, to live a dignified life. And you mentioned breaking bread and staying overnight. Can you say something about why you think that being there, not just for an evening meeting or an afternoon meeting, uh, why that's important that it yeah. be over a longer period of time? You mentioned a weekend or a week or longer. So even before this whole four years of the Trump administration, I think mm -hmm. some of us have been very clear that the, the, the question of race, number one, you know, has not been resolved in this country. Literally, that has not been resolved. And uh, although many people would argue, oh, you know, Obama was the first black president. Yeah, but I think it got worse when he was the, when he became the president. I think white supremacy was just just came out of the everywhere and 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 became really active i think number two it's not just a question of you know black and white i think it's the question of whiteness against everything else that is not understood right and to me that has been always clear has been always clear but Coming from, uh, uh, and I always say this, I think that if you ever have the opportunity to, to go outside your community, go to a different country, even go to a different city, do it. You need to get out of your own bubbles. Mm -hmm. And because we grow up with so many, pre you know, with so much prejudice, we learn that, you know, by interacting with, you know, the, 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 the media, by interacting with uh, false information, and sometimes we learn it because we don't have the adequate education and not mm -hmm. just the formal education, but the informal education. And so it's important to learn, you know, and demystify things that we take for granted about other people. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I think that has been one of the greatest experiences for me as a human being to be able to learn, you know, how great it is for other people to speak another language. Uh, mm-hmm. For you to try to learn their language, for them to try your own language, for you to try their food, for them to try your food. I am very proud of my, of, of, of our culture, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure other people are very proud of their cultures. And so uh, that uh, 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 mutual learning, it's, it's when we realize that at the end of the day, you know, we all want the same thing. You know, we want to have a great family. We want to have a roof over our heads. We want to have a decent education. We want to have a good job. We want to be healthy. And we want to have a dignified way of living. And uh, But sometimes, you know, prejudice gets in, in, in our way. And, and, it, and it isn't until we live with people, we interact with people that are different than us, mm-hmm. when we stop making assumptions and we realize, you know, the why of things, the you know, to begin to understand uh, that sometimes, the many times being different, that's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a, it's a, it's a plus. And yeah. that collectively, collectively, we make up, you know, the, the community that we want to have, right? That we want to live in. And uh, so I think uh, uh, that's a really, really unique opportunity for us to learn, to learn yeah. a lot. And you're saying staying overnight and breaking mm-hmm. bread with people, you're saying is a key part of that that learning. That's really what's needed. The process. It, it, yeah, it can't just be uh, an evening meeting between 7.30 and 9 o'clock somewhere. Right. Right. No, I, I get that. No, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Do you have any other uh, final thoughts? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's a name for this center. I know you said somewhere in the country with a room for at least a hundred people. Do you have any other thoughts about uh, uh, how this might work or? Well, uh, one of the things that, yes. One of the, I don't, haven't thought, I haven't gotten that far yet in terms of thinking of a particular name, but I do think that one of the um, things that would make it attractive uh, for the small community groups to be able to utilize such a space is the ability to bring to, tra- to to transport people from location to their location to to the center, and so I envision to build a uh, some sort of transportation cooperative where we, uh, you know, uh, work on vehicles that I don't know potentially can uh, use uh, environmentally friendly fuel, veggie oil, biofuel, some, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not right. an expert in those areas, but that is something that is it, a technology that's already available out there. There are people that are doing it in other parts of the country, and why couldn't we do it here? And right. it would yeah. help bring people from downtown Boston to, you know, Western Mass or Vermont or Maine, whatever, right. you know, the center and, and ends up um, uh, uh, uh you know, being being constructed, but that just takes such a burden for organizations and organizers. Okay, uh, yep. it takes Get a lot there. of stress yeah. off of their plate. Yeah. Okay, Edwin Argeta of Jobs with Justice. Thank you so much for joining us today, and this center that you envision out in the country, wherever it'll be, and it'll be a place where people can get to and break bread and learn from each other, I think, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, is really important. Uh, So we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, but making it happen, I think, is going to take a center that uh, Edwin Argeta and others are envisioning now. So thank you very much for joining us, Edwin. Uh, We look forward to hearing more news about the center, and we hope you and other people who is supporting it can come back soon and uh, let us know what they can do to make this center a reality.